your guest. Uh, my name is Uwe Rau. I'm the director here of the Goethe Institute in Toronto. Tonight I have the pleasure to welcome you for a special talk with Christoph Terhechte from Berlin. Uh, the series uh, Culture Talks at Goethe is designed to cultivate dialogue around arts, culture and international exchange and allows audiences to participate in Q&As, to engage in conversation with German and Canadian artists, experts and commentators. We are delighted to present some of the most interesting creative minds mm -hmm. of today. Through sharing their work and thoughts in an intimate environment here at our institute, Tontonians get a first-hand glimpse of what's going on in Germany. Christoph Terhechte is the director of the Berlinale Forum and on this year's Hot Dogs jury. He is going to introduce and contextualize Philipp Schaeffner's slow cinema film, Havari, right here installed at our media space. In 2016, he hosted the film's world premiere in Berlin, as well as many of Schaeffner's previous films. Christoph Dech has studied political science and journalism in Hamburg, and has since worked as a film journalist in Germany and Paris for the Taz newspaper amongst others. In 1991, he became film editor at the Berlin City magazine, TIP. He has been a member of the selection committee of the Berlinale Section Forum since 1997, and in 2001, he was appointed head of forum. I'd like to thank our program curator, my dear colleague, Jutta Brendemühl, and our team here at the Goethe Institute for putting this event together. And Jutta will tell you a little bit more what to expect. Uh, I wish all of us a pleasant and stimulating evening. Thank you very much. And schönen Abend. Vielen Dank. Thanks, Jutta. Um, just a quick show of hands. How many people have seen Havari as the whole 90-minute piece? Oh, OK. Yes. Very good. Um, so I mean, that's the whole idea. It is installed here and uh, in a sort of pri private viewing installation. Um, and I'm sure Christoph will talk a bit about how we got from three minutes of found footage to a 90 minute piece. Um, just so that you know about the flow tonight, we're going to show, let's see, we'll feel it out, 10, 12 minutes uh, of the film. For you who haven't seen it, then you'll get an idea of sound and image, uh, of how sound and image work together. And then Christoph will talk a bit about, of course, what the forum does about form and content in, in daring film works that he's been curating uh, uh, for a long time in arguably the best uh, section of any film festival uh, for experimental and innovative works. Um, and talk a bit about the relationship that the Berlinale has with Philip Schaeffner. I think you've shown probably all of his work. Five, 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 five films, films, yes. All of his, his main it? films. Um, if you do want to come back, you're most welcome to see the whole piece, the 90-minute piece, as it was meant to be shown. And we do have a little uh, sort of mini reading room with a portfolio of background information, as well as this book uh, by Philip Schaffner's partner, Mele Kröger, uh, Collision, which is in a way a translation for Havari, the word Havari. Uh, it is advertised as a maritime thriller. Uh, which made me a bit suspicious, but it turns out it's a fantastic book that captures and fictionalizes a lot of the research over two years that went into the making of this piece. Um, and uh, it's a very, very interesting read on top of what Christopher will pre present right now. And then yeah, I, I wouldn't have mind to, minded to watch the whole film again. Yeah, you <laughs> it's were like totally immersed. I don't know that. how you feel, but. You, you get into it. I, I, got, I got into it uh, very quickly, even uh, when we saw it for the first time and had no idea what to expect. But I think before talking about uh, Philip's work in general and about this film in particular, I would like to <coughs> explain what the Berlinale is, what the forum is, how it is situated in the context of the festival. And uh, that's hard to do if I don't go back to the beginnings of the festival. Berlinale is now in its, in its 68th year. Um, it was actually founded by the CIA. Um, <laughs> a part of uh, the cultural diplomacy in the Cold War. Um, West Berlin needed some big cultural event, um, which was part of the strategy to uh, keep this island in, in the communist system. And um, it quickly grew into one of the most important film festivals in Europe, so-called A-Festival. 
Now, a festival simply means that it's accredited with an association. Uh, the uh, it's actually the association of the producers' associations of the world, uh, la Fédération internationale des associations des producteurs de films, and <coughs> you pay them a fee. It's a bit like the mafia, and then they uh, protect you. Um, <laughs> or like a McDonald's franchise, I don't know. You uh, promise to uh, have certain standards, um, among which is uh, having international premieres and world premieres in competition. And for a long time, this, this competition was the only program of the festival, actually, until the late uh, 1960s. And uh, the films were not uh, selected in the way that they are now. Today we have a submission process, everyone can send their films, uh, there are selection committees, they look at the films. At that time there was a small selection committee that only looked at films that the producers' associations from different countries in the world were sending. So for example in Japan there were four or five big uh, companies and they had the right to send only one film per company and then these five films were being looked at in Germany and sometimes a Japanese film was chosen for competition. Which meant, because that was the case with all of the big festivals, that uh, for example the company Shochiku Chach had a new film by Ozu every year and so they would only ever submit Ozu films to <laughs> all of the festivals uh, and none of the other directors of Shochiku and they had great directors uh, like Kinoshita for example uh, were ever uh, seeing their films submitted to international festivals. So there was a huge part of the, of the filmmaking in the world that never made it to uh, the, the Western festivals. And when the world started to become a little more transparent uh, in the 60s and uh, people traveled a little more and found out there was much more than they had been seeing, um, there was a need suddenly to have an alternative view on, on world cinema. Uh, and the first uh, such group that created an alternative festival within the big festival was the uh, Quinzaine des Réalisateurs in France, in Cannes, who used the fact that the 1968 Cannes Festival had been interrupted uh, in May 68. Um, it's easy to imagine why, um, to create a, a counter festival. Uh, two years later the same thing happened in Berlin in 1970. Berlinale was interrupted. There was a controversy about a German film called OK by Michael Verhoeven which dealt with the Vietnam War and the American Jewry president uh, demanded that the film be taken out of competition which didn't happen so the festival just came to a halt. And in 71, uh, an association in Berlin that had also just opened the cinema, the Asana Cinema, decided to hold a counter festival, the Forum. Now I've seen TV images from 1971 where the red carpet for competition is virtually empty. There's no one. No one's going to the competition films and the Forum cinemas were packed. There was a real need to see something completely new, completely different. Uh, that uh, took into account all the, the movements of uh, new cinema that had happened in the 1960s and that had not been reflected by, by the Berlinale. So immediately the Senate of Berlin told the, this group of people uh, who ran the Arsenal and the Forum uh, that they should do it again and they gave them um, more money that th than they actually needed to run the festival. <laughs> I think it was 300,000 marks, which at the time was an incredible sum. So Ulrich Greger, who was the first director of the forum, and his wife Erika, together with a group of three other people, decided that they should use this money to actually buy the prints of the films that they were showing, uh, to subtitle them into German and to start an archive. So now. After 48 years of the forum, uh, the Arsenal is thriving in a new location with two cinemas. We have an archive with over 7,000 titles and uh, the forum is still being run by the Arsenal. So it is part of the Berlinale but it's still independent in its programming and it's independent in its organization and there is a constant flow of ideas and uh, a continuity between the programming of the forum and the arsenal. 
for example, we have uh, had this year uh, the world premiere of a film by Ruth Beckermann, um, and I forgot the title again because I'm really bad with titles. Uh, Waldheim's Walzer, Waldheim's Waltz, mm -hmm. about um, the e election of the uh, president Kurt Waldheim, who had been in Austria. In Austria, yes, um, who had been a Nazi but uh, didn't remember he was one, um, <laughs> and. Um, and then, a little later, we had a retrospective of uh, Ruth Beckermann's films in the Arsenal. On the other hand, there may be films that the Arsenal programmers discover, and then out of that, um, they somehow make it to the next forum. Um, and I think Philip is an example of someone who was well known to the Arsenal programmers because I uh, heard of his, his work. Um, and we showed his first film um, in the forum years ago. Um, after he was recommended to me by one of the, the programs of the Arsenal. So that's a bit the, the setup of, of, of the forum. Um, what happened in the festival was that after the forum got so successful that nobody really uh, came to see the competition anymore, um, there were changes in the festival itself. There was a new director, he revived, uh, he, he, he made a new concept for the for the festival. He stayed only for two years, but his idea was to move the festival that had been in July, so it was trapped between Cannes and Venice, to February. Not a very popular idea because the weather in Berlin in February is no better than the weather in Toronto in February. And uh, it, suddenly there were no, um, y y you couldn't just walk around in the sunshine and enjoy a uh, good drink and good food and then occasionally see a film. It became a serious film event, event because it's the only place where you felt uh, safe during this <laughs> horrible winter was inside and in the cinemas. In fact, it made the festival a much bigger place. Um, this the second director of the festival resigned after two years because he didn't know how much administrative work uh, his job also entailed. And then he was replaced uh, by the third director, Maurice de Hanel, who decided that the forum was too much of a competition and he wanted to have his own sideshow. He created a show called uh, Infoschau, uh, which was later baptized uh, Panorama. So this became the third leg of the festival. Now, Panorama, because it was supposed to do something similar to the forum, um, actually is overlapping in what they program until today with what we do. And we're often asked, uh, where is the difference between forum and par uh, panorama? Aside from the historical differences that I just explained, um, we never found a good one. <laughs> um, a few years ago, I was watching television after the festival. There was a report on the on, on the Berlinale, and uh, they asked some people on the street uh, during the festival about different issues of the festival. And there was a woman who was asked, "What's the difference between Forum and Panorama?" And she said, "That's so easy. The Forum is round, and the Panorama is wide." <laughs> and yeah, I think that is the difference between the sections. Um, now. If I'm not asked about that difference, but about what the forum does, I would say in the forum, films are chosen not as much because of their content, but for their form. Um, or to put it another way, form always has to be just as important as content. It should never be the, the other way around. And while there are exceptions, I think, that Philip's works, and especially Havari, are a very good example for how form and content can marry in a very original, unusual way uh, where neither overshadows the other. Um, and we will be talking about that. But before we come to Philip's work and to this film, maybe we can start one first round of questions because I don't know how familiar you are with different festivals and you all know Toronto certainly but um, aside from it both festivals comparable to wavelengths if you wanted to give an analogy yeah. to, to <coughs> right 
the forum is a bit like the Wavelengths program and in fact uh, we've always had films from Wavelengths in Berlin because the forum only requires a European premiere and Wavelengths has always been programming films that had premiered in the forum before so there is a similarity uh, and the biggest similarity between the festivals is that uh, they both are meant to be audience festivals whereas Cannes and Venice the other big festivals in Europe are mostly for the industry Forum expanded yeah. exists. Maybe you want to just yeah, forum expanded is another initi initiative within the forum. It's ba basically just a label that we gave to a, uh, a strain in the programming that we've always had. Um, you may be familiar with the term expanded cinema, which um, was mostly applied to some American filmmakers in the 1970s, uh, Ken Jacobs and, and others, who were um, trying to escape from the notion that a film has a certain running time and is shown in a certain place on a flat screen and it's always the same setup. They started to experiment with projection uh, from different angles to several walls, to leave the cinema space, uh, to modify projectors and so on and so on. <coughs> and those experiments were often shown uh, in uh, festivals that showed experimental films, ex including the Forum. So what happened in <coughs> the 1990s and then certainly in the early 2000s is that many filmmakers uh, actually had to leave the cinema space or the medium of cinema because it was very hard to finance uh, their experimental films within the context of cinema but it became easier to do so within the art context. Um, in the art world there was a lot more money, uh, the artists were taken much more seriously and uh, people, I mean renowned filmmakers were asked to make an installation and not a film. And that led to, led to many filmmakers say, uh, saying, okay, we'll do the installation and we'll finance our project by doing the installation in the gallery space where rich collectors pay an insane amount of money for a DVD that's numbered uh, and then we'll use the budget to make the film that we wanted to make. And in this situation, we decided that we should have a program that would actually attract people from the art world to the cinema to the festival and at the same time open uh, the eyes of our audiences, faithful audiences that usually come every year to see films in the forum to what was going on in the art world and um, to, to have installations and uh, exhibitions of uh, cinematic uh, art. And that's been going on now for 11 or 12 years, I'm not quite sure. Um, it's, it's, been, it's been a while and we combined that. Uh, the last three years we had an exhibition in the Academy of Arts in Berlin, in a beautiful space. And at the same time they have a big theater where we were showing films from both programs, Forum and Forum Expanded, which ex actually it's, it, it is more or less the same uh, except that there are separate curators who uh, select films for the Forum Expanded program. But we very often discuss should this film be here or there and how can we best, um, best uh, promote um, this filmmaker or this installation. Was Leviathan, sorry, <laughs> I have many questions mm. as you want. Leviathan, Leviathan was... Uh, uh, for yeah. It was yeah, yeah, you're right. I, we we showed it. We showed it in the Delphi it Cinema because it's like a big. Uh, yeah. It's meant yeah. to be on the big screen. Um, at the same time, the filmmakers are deeply rooted in the art world, and um, and the concept really worked. I think we we really brought a new audience to the festival um, that would usually go to galleries and at the same time we um, we interested a lot of people in a different space for visual for I mean for moving images but the length of works the length of works yes um, the forum does not show short films um, there is a good space for short films in Berlin. Um, it's called the Berlinale Shorts, <laughs> and uh, it's very exper experimental too, and, and, and very much in the in the vein of the of the forum itself. 
but in Form Expanded we do combine um, short films into uh, full-fledged programs. Um, but it's, it's a mix of installation, short films um, and feature-length films. Forum is also v known for excessively long films. I think the, I, I don't know what the record was, something like 16 or 17 hours. Um, uh, but we always have like at least the, the four hour film. We, we had f two this year, a documentary yeah. and, oh that's also important, with a documentary and, and um, fiction film. We don't distinguish between uh, documentary and fiction. <coughs> I <coughs> only know films that are made for the cinema and I really don't care whether it's documentary or fiction. Uh, Philip's film is an example of a film that has a lot of narrative. Um, it's not fiction in the sense that it's made up, um, but it works as a narrative stream. Um, and we, don't, we never label the films as, as documentaries or, or fiction. And retrospectives? Yes, that's another important part of our program. We don't have full-fledged retrospectives. There is a retrospective every year in the Berlinale. Sometimes it's thematic, sometimes it's the person. But um, having overlooked films from earlier times in uh, the program has always been a very important part of our work. Because we believe that film history um, as written in like the hundred films you have to see before you die or the 1001 films you have to see b before you die is complete bullshit and the canon has been created by people at a certain time um, who knew maybe 10% of what had happened in the world um, and said this is important like Citizen Kane is the best film ever made in the history of cinema that, that was like Everyone agreed upon that. Why? Because they hadn't seen the Japanese masters. They certainly hadn't seen films from in India at the time. Uh, and this this world cinema as as we as we know it now was just not really known. A few people were able to see to see Brazilian films. Others uh, had the chance to uh, know more about uh, films behind the Iron Curtain. But um, film history has always tended to neglect more than it highlighted. And so I think it's super important to go back and without saying this is a masterpiece and this is more important than that, but just give people the chance to revisit film history and to look more in the margins than in the center. Mm -hmm. Margins and centers may be a good uh, and perspective was mm. a good keyword to get to Havari and yeah. how you premiered it in, in Berlin. Well, that was the, important to Philip Schaffner. The year that Havari showed, we also showed an, uh, another film by Philip uh, called Under Guess. So both films were in the same program, which does not happen that often. I think every two or three years it happens that we have two films by the same filmmaker. So it's, it was kind of a it's very stressful for the filmmaker, of course. He has to attend not just four, but eight Q&As. And I think after that, you just want to have a vacation. But um, it was exciting also because the two films were so different. I should probably start with the first one that we showed. It was the Half Moon Files. Um, I'm not quite sure how many years ago that was. Maybe 12 years ago or something like that. Yeah. 10 years ago. What the half moon files? No, I, yeah, really? That sure. Okay. Well, anyway, the half moon files. Um, the the key word in that title is probably files, because Philip's work is always uh, about research. I mean, now every documentary filmmaker will do some research, but I'm saying about research. It's um, it's not the research that you do so you can tell a story. It the research always becomes part of Philip's films and that's what's so unique about him um, and what probably defines most if not all of the films that we've shown and that he's made. Um, in the Half Moon Files um, the idea or the, the object that led to research were voices from the past. Voices recorded um, 
at the end of the First World War, uh, when prisoners of war uh, in Germany um, were documented on these, I don't know how, the, how, they, how they're called, these, these, these uh, wax rolls that you recorded sound on a hundred years ago. Cylinders. Cylinders, yeah, wax cylinders that you recorded sound <coughs> on. And the cylinders became, uh, and they're in archives in, in Hamburg, I think, nowadays, um, the cylinders became um, a document of the cultures of the people who were um, captives of, of war at the time, um, including, um, including Muslims, um, this uh, half moon, half moon files, who uh, actually had their, their own synagogue build. Um, uh, they, they, oh, sorry, their own mosque built at the <laughs> Okay, well, all the religions are closely related. <laughs> their own mosque built uh, at the time. And Philip started to, to research uh, and, and combine a lot of elements that, um, in, in their very unusual combination, are also typical for, for his films. Since in his second film, The Day of the Sparrow, um, he had the approach of an ornithologist uh, and an approach, the approach of someone who was um, reflecting upon war and the absence of war from our, from our conscience, from our minds um, at a time where it was raging and where we are involved in it. So how do you combine a sparrow with what was going on in Afghanistan? Um, I, you probably have to see this film and I recommend that you see this film to find out how exactly he worked with that. Now the third film we showed was called Revision and there the, the object that uh, Philip took as, um, as an incentive to, for his research was uh, an article about uh, killings on the German-Polish border when Poland was not yet part of the EU nowadays, it's an open border, um, when a group of Roma uh, from Romania, I think, or were they from Bulgaria, I'm not I think Romanian, Romanian Roma uh, crossed the border and two were shot dead um, by um, people who pretended it was a hunting accident uh, in a forest on the border. And he started to do research. Who are these people? What became of them? What became of uh, the families and so on? And made a film that was revising the police documents from the time and the testimonies and he was documenting in the film how the um, original statements had uh, come together and asking the uh, protagonists um, to to revise those statements, to comment on uh, the original recordings and so on. It became a very complex film that of course was centered on the question of racism, but also um, documented the research itself in, in a way that I'd never seen it before. Which brings us to the year that we showed Havari and Ander Guess, the other film. Ander Guess is very particular in the sense that Philip for the first time gave up some of the control that he had over his films and he gave uh, the camera to the protagonists of the previous film of Revision. So this Romanian co-director um, and Philip made a film from two different perspectives. Um, w it, it was kind of a sequel to Revision uh, but at the same time it was a companion piece to Havari because both films are about refugees and about um, the situation that refugees face on their way to, uh, to Northern Europe, to Germany in this case. Um, and Havari was shot in a way that uh, probably more closely resembles what we um, what we've seen 
uh, in, in cinema and television during the big refugee crisis when the film was made. But it's exactly because of that that Philip decided not to make a film that resembled all the others. He thought there were too many images of that kind. And he understood that the object, in this case, the object that he had to examine um, was the film itself that he found on YouTube. This clip, which we just saw in an extremely uh, slowed down, actually at the ratio of 1 to 30 pace. Um, and so by using that as the only image of the whole film, three minute clip extended to 90 minutes, which means uh, uh, one frame becomes 30 frames. So every frame is a little longer than a second. Um, we, we examine it in, in, the, in the proper sense of the word. We can see every single frame after frame of that film, which was shot by a tourist. Um, his name is Terry Diamond, an Irish tourist, who happened to be on a cruise ship um, when they spotted this small boat in the middle of the Mediterranean. And it actually took 90 minutes from the moment that uh, the boat was spotted until the moment that the refugees were rescued from that uh, dinghy on the, on the ocean. So that corresponds very well. He did not throw away all the other material that he shot because he did an <coughs> extensive research. He found the people um, who were on the boat, he found the people on the cruise ship, he, you can hear some of the recordings of um, uh, the sea rescuers. Sea rescuers. Um, he put all of that together, but he uses everything that he shot uh, in the soundtrack. So we hear the stories, and I think we can focus much better on what is actually being said than in a, in a typical Talking Heads film, where uh, other things come to mind. Um, you see the faces of the people. Um, it, it's so reduced that I think it's, it's much more effective. It, you haven't seen the, the whole film, or most of you haven't seen the whole film, I would encourage you to come back and, and see it on the, on the monitors here. Um, it is, in a way, a much more um, captivating film than any, any piece of fiction or any uh, investigative uh, documentary uh, with uh, talking heads and, and inserts and everything could, uh, could ever be. And because he reflected, not just in this film, but in all of his films, so much about the form of, uh, of the film, it is prob probably what I would call an uh, archetypical film of our program. I'm open to answer questions. Um, yes, please. I'm wondering if, uh, if Philip had considered experimenting with this kind of slow cinematic form before coming up with the, the topic for the film and the content, or whether the form grew out of the content? Because for me, it seemed like there was a real resonance between those, mm -hmm. and the slowness and the disjointedness of the image really spoke, you know, I could tie that into the experience of the refugees. As, mm, as far as I know, he actually edited this other film that doesn't exist now. Um, he edited a film in which you actually see the um, testimonials of all the people that you only hear now, and he was unhappy with the, with the result. Um, there is a letter uh, published on the website of the forum uh, that you can look up, um, where he explains to his TV editors, uh, who had commissioned uh, the work, why he will not deliver what he was supposed to deliver. So I think, yes, he, the film was done and he was unhappy with it, so he decided then that it should take a completely different form. In that sense, the form was actually born out of a necessity to produce something that was different from what you saw too much of uh, at the time. And while we have the Toronto premiere, I should add that it showed in Montreal at the film festival mm -hmm. where it won this film, this version, won Best Edit. Um, we had a that's little conversation. That's an enormous. Yeah, it's, it's enormous, a, yeah. exactly. But um, that maybe leads me to prompt you, uh, Christoph, um, to talk about something that we touched upon yesterday briefly about the role of editing, especially in documentary formats, mm. perhaps. 
I, the question even what is filmmaking versus editing like here I mean it's in the edit I, I mean it, I was a bit polemic uh, when when I came here and we talked about it uh, I, what I was saying is that um, I mean, here you said I'm, I'm on the hot dogs jury. I'm in, on one of the juries, especially for, for mid-length films. And um, I enjoyed it so much um, because... Hot dogs means? Means between 41 and 60 minutes. Yeah, yeah I think mm -hmm. so. Because um, everything below is a short film and everything uh, above 60 or 65 is, is considered a feature-length film. Uh, so when you do a film in between these formats, uh, you must have thought very well about what, we, what you were doing. Um, whereas whenever I look at a program and I see that I have to see a lot of films of 110 or 117 minutes, I always think, oh my god, maybe it could have been a bit shorter, maybe the editing was sloppy. Uh, and actually I found out that uh, the films that I saw here in the, in the program, 15 films altogether, were not all of them, but most of them examples of really uh, good editing, really um, well thought of editing. And that's probably uh, because the films have the length that the films require and not the length that uh, the commissioning editor or the producer requires. Um, or um, the filmmaker thought he couldn't throw away a uh, certain material that he shot. It's like every uh, editor knows the, knows the sentence, kill your darlings, um, which means the filmmakers can't let go of a certain scene that they shot and uh, the editor knows better and says if you have to let go and you have to understand that for the rhythm of the film, for the um, for the dramatic structure of the film, this won't work. I don't know whether this answers your question, but um, I'm certainly no <laughs> expert in editing, but as a film critic, um, as uh, what, what I worked as before becoming uh, a curator, as a film critic, I always enjoyed my interviews with editors much more than with filmmakers because filmmakers are often completely incapable of explaining their work whereas editors uh, they know so much more than the filmmakers themselves um, that is it, it, it's, it's a joy to to uh, talk with them about structural um, questions and, and uh, the, the material of a film. Were you personally at the um, the premiere in Berlin, or did you have to introduce another film? Because there's a the story is about the the physical world premiere and Philip Schaffner. The, and the first screening, no, I was not there. Right, mm. because <coughs> and Berlin brought in. A he brought the, yes. the yes, right, he protagonist, yes. Yes, he brought the protagonist, in, including uh, Abdullah, whose name we heard here in the. Um, the voice of the girl. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, actually it was very, very hard to bring him here because he'd been uh, trying to cross the Mediterranean several times and was always sent back. And uh, usually the authorities are not so happy with... Um, Visitors' uh, visa for yeah, civil rights. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the, the visa for uh, coming to the Berlinale are issued in the countries of origin and especially in Africa and also in uh, North Africa in the, in the Maghreb, um, they're not so cooperative. Even though uh, there is an official invitation of the festival, which is uh, financed by the Ministry of Culture, that doesn't really help. We had to pull strings to, to get him to Berlin. Uh, and I think we only succeeded because Philip vowed that he would, uh, I mean, th th there's a, he gave a guarantee for sponsor him if, if, he, if he stayed. It's, I mean, it's such a tragic situation um, that she's in, we, we heard that in the, in the dialogue uh, for a moment, that she's in France and can't go back to Algeria and uh, he just cannot, um, cannot uh, travel as freely as uh, probably all of us here can. I think the story goes on. I mean, there's multiple voices that we didn't see mm. now. But you haven't seen that yet. Mm. But just after where we unfortunately had to stop, she explains how 
ironically then the fact that she married him in Algeria while being in France led to her French visa being can not mm. renewed because you know, you're married to mm. him in, in Algeria. Well, mm. you know, why would you live in France? So it's this constant interconnectivity of, of issues and familial um, yeah. yeah, relationships. I can add <coughs> as a commissioning editor that Philip's next film is about her. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. I did not know that. Yeah. Me neither, uh, I didn't know. Rasha Salti, <laughs> who works for the Berlinale and Arte and, and uh, formerly TIFF, um, you did that interview that we posted yeah. at the forum right yeah. back in 2016, yeah. which had a bit of a cluster. I mean, Christoph mentioned both of uh, Philip Schaffner's films, but also quite a lot of other films that started to reflect what ha was happening, yeah, crucially the year before 2015, but of course also already before. So there was a cluster of sort of migration and refugee yeah. crisis uh, and films, and show. you uh, moderated uh, um, for the conversation. Dynamics. For but talents. You hosted, exactly, you hosted there at, at Talents, and that's on our film blog, as is um, a background uh, interview with not Gilsef de Hechte, but his former newspaper, Tats, um, with Philip Schaffner, which is quite elucidating. I don't know whether it was there, because people keep asking me, of course, what happened to the pe these people on that particular boat. Um, and they all survived, but they're all deported is what yeah. I, mm. the information that I had. Yeah, I, I can't say exactly, but that, that's what I heard yeah, too. Yeah, that's what I heard. Yeah. Philip is involved in um, a lot of films as a producer. Of Yeah, yeah. Uh, recently arrived filmmakers to Berlin. Um, and I think uh, as a producer, he's, he's been in been an incredible mentor. Mm. Jellyfish. Yeah, Jellyfish by um, uh, Khaled Abdelwahid, who's now also one of the um, curators of Forum Expanded. Yeah. So, who is that? A Syrian filmmaker who uh, arrived, uh, who arrived uh, in Berlin in 2015. Uh, from Turkey, Greece, walked, and then a year later his companion followed him. And Except that the boat she was on capsized, and she had a camera. And she almost drowned, but uh, she, her camera was strapped to her hand, and she, um, and she filmed everything. And that's going to be a, a film that oh. both are working the on. The other film that you mentioned is a film that we wanted to show, yeah. uh, but, but yeah. couldn't because um, some of the protagonists were still in Syria. And uh, yeah, the first film that the Syrian filmmaker yeah. made uh, was produced by Philip was a film about uh, the young men who became war photographers in Syria. And uh, yeah, so the film was never shown because their lives yeah, were too dangerous. Yeah. Instead, um, instead uh, Stephanie, who uh, is responsible for the uh, Forum Expanded program, uh, asked him to um, start curating with her, and he's now one of the regular curators of the of the program. Right. Yeah. Well, so, when any, anything else you can tease? When is the when could that film be the, at the, the forum? The film that I'm talking <laughs> about, is, mm. yeah, it's called The Purple Sea, and I think it's an Arte production. I mean, I know about it very much because it's a it's an Arte, it's an Arte production. production, and it will be in Cannes, so like a, mm -hmm. a crazy film, as they say in Arte. Uh, but uh, I think it's going to be finished next year. Uh, so it's 2019. Philip's film has just started. I think he's looking for funding, mm -hmm. uh, and because she's in France, it's going to be set in France, so it's a completely different funding scheme. Yep, I think it will take time. And another 2020, which is a round anniversary, isn't it? Oh yes, that'll be the uh, 70s Berlinale and the 50th Forum. It's always hard to celebrate these um, forum birthdays because it's always overshadowed <laughs> by so they shouldn't have started in 71, they should have started in 70 or 72, then uh, we would have our independent birthdays. Yeah. <laughs> Is there anything that you can tell us about 
the next forum? I mean, sort of, you know, after Berlinale is before Berlinale uh, and forum, right? So I guess you're in the middle of scouting and you travel mm, a lot. Yeah, not so yet in the middle of scouting, but beginning to scout for next year. It's, it's usually um, in Cannes that you get an idea of where things are happening currently. And Cannes is a place where we gather a lot of information. Um, and where we meet, of course, with people from all around the world who tell us uh, you should come to this country and that city or that festival this year because there's something exciting happening. And it's after Khan usually that we do our um, schedules for the fall um, and decide where the uh, programmers, where the curators should actually travel and see for themselves which is a very important part of, of uh, the selection process. Um, we do have a submission process where everyone can submit their films and we see all of the submitted films. In the case of the forum, it's about 2,500 features that uh, we have to screen. Um, but for the forum alone? For the forum alone, yes. That's a big chunk of... It's enormous, yes. When I started as uh, a member of the selection committee, uh, the number was 800. And at the time, the committee had always insisted on seeing all of the films that were submitted as a group. But th in my first year, I noticed that 700 was the magic number. You just <laughs> physically could not see more than 700 <laughs> films in well, that limited... Uh, no, no, it's not just because of that. It's like uh, we were screening films from 10 in the morning until 10 p.m. and seven days a week. It's just not possible to see more films than 700 in that limited uh, <laughs> time uh, frame. Uh, and so when I took over, I changed the system. And uh, now we have uh, a group of pre-screeners, uh, about a dozen people who see all of those 2,500 <coughs> films. So each of them sees, uh, on average, 200 films. Uh, and they write a report on every single film that's been, been submitted and um, based on those reports we decide which of the films we see in, in the committee. So it's a, it's, it's a huge process, but in fact that process contributes to less than 10% of the program. Because um, most of our work is actively scouting, uh, actively um, uh, finding films, and um, even though the world is huge, um, it's, it's small in the sense that wherever something exciting is happening, if you do, if you <laughs> do the right scouting, you will probably find it. I'm always surprised and pleasantly surprised when something comes up that we didn't already, uh, that wasn't already on a hor horizon. It happens every year, but sometimes it's just one film, th sometimes it's three. It's never as much as you would think when you think of the 2,500 uh, submissions that we receive. Um, and of course, I'm sure we make mistakes and I'm sure we've overlooked some great films, but I'm confident that uh, those films have popped up uh, in other festivals yeah. that were happy that uh, Stupid Berlinale has overlooked those films. <laughs> <laughs> so you have to go to Berlin, February, make a note. <laughs> it was nice weather this year. I sat on a patio and had ice cream. Just saying, it's unusual, <laughs> but <laughs> it happens. <laughs> Everything is relative, yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll, have to, we'll probably have to uh, get you back. Uh, thank you so much, Christoph. We can still mingle if you have questions uh, off the record, so to speak. Um, Christoph has mentioned it, he is actually here as a guest of the Goethe Institute, but in his main role as one of the uh, jurors on one of the juries in uh, Hot Dogs Festival, the best dog festival on the planet. Um, <laughs> there is the, I said it. Is the award-winning film uh, shown again? It, I mean, yes, they well, always so show the well, winners well, the weekend, afterwards. Right? Yeah, the weekend, yeah. Yes. I really so like the one that we've selected, and you'll you'll <laughs> know after tomorrow. Yes, I heard only good things actually. Mm. So I think it was a strong year. <laughs> I should also mention <laughs> Havari is all well is and was and continues to be also co-presented by the Images Festival and Contact mm. 
uh, mm -hmm. photo festival. Mm -hmm. um, and that kind of was important to me, uh, to, to get the installation here at the Goethe into those three festivals, because it is experimental. It's also a documentary format. And it also is a conversation about, well, nearly still and moving images in the frames um, that uh, Christoph so nicely described for us. So we will wait for the next uh, Philip Schaeffner film at the Berlinale and maybe at Tiffer Burlaki or the Goethe Institute and to have both of you back, hopefully. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>